quieting down now, and um, I certainly feel a lot better after that. Uh, so my name is Dr. Elizabeth Thompson, and uh, I'm chief exec of this new Portland Centre for Integrative Medicine, a community interest company. And uh, I just wanted to just say a few uh, words about it, because we want to be part of a movement for change in healthcare, and it feels like the timing is right. Over in America, in the States, this is Andy Vile, who's developed a term called integrative medicine. And starting off with 15 healthcare professionals, 30, he now trains around 100 a year. And they're now integrative orthopedic surgeons, integrative oncologists, nurses, physios, OTs. And it is an amazing movement um, that is changing the face of healthcare. This is a definition of integrative medicine, reaffirming the importance of the relationship between practitioner and patient, focusing on the whole person, informed by evidence, and using a full range of approaches to stimulate health and well-being. The Portland Centre was very fortunate to win a, a Bristol Green Capital uh, grant that allowed us to start to connect with all the community food educators that are out there in Bristol. So Kitchen on Prescription was already being delivered in the Healthy Living Centre at Wellspring. But one of the things that we have been doing is mapping out all of the organisations, the Square Food, Heartcliff, all our partners are there on that banner. But we've also been inputting nutritional, psychological, dietetic input to create a course that might then become part of a mainstream <coughs> health offer. And we're also research active within the Portland Centre. And in the new year, we'll start to deliver a feasibility study looking at this kitchen on prescription and whether it can help children with obesity. And we're trying to target some of the very difficult aspects of modern life. Our mindfulness team has been designing and will deliver in the new year uh, mindfulness for depression, for stress and anxiety. And some of those offers will be private as we get the whole thing up and running. But we do want and hope, hope for some core funding. This week I was very touched um, by a young man with sickle cell anemia and he experiences a lot of chronic pain. And he came in and said, I'm feeling a lot better. And he was using quite a diverse approach with pain management program and mindfulness and some homeopathy. But he said, I meditate 10 minutes every day now. And I said to him, what does that do for you? And he said, well, before my whole life was pain, but after 10 minutes of meditation, my pain reduces down, it becomes manageable, and then I can see the rest of the world out there. So this is really crucial. And what was also crucial was that he was able to reduce significantly his morphine. So at the age of 23, he was on five major drugs, and he wasn't comfortable. Most people are not comfortable to be on polypharmacy. And we've got to the point now where so many people are on pharmaceutical agents that it's actually coming into our environment, affecting animals, the rivers. We really are at a point of crisis where we need to reduce those pharmaceutical agents. I was also very fortunate because I was seeing him in the homeopathic clinic, which that service has now been transferred just this week to the Portland Centre for Integrative Medicine, and we'll be delivering it out of Litfield House. But in fact, that homeopathic service, that holistic offer, has been there since 1948, uh, which is quite extraordinary. And as you know, there's been a lot of criticism about it. But actually, for the, all those years, we've been offering holistic care within the NHS. But now's the opportunity to broaden it out and offer a whole lot more. Our arts lead, Fiona Hamilton, will be delivering a course in the new year supporting people in later life using creative writing. And inspired by Atul Gawande's book, I don't know whether you've come across it being mortal, the Portland Centre also assisted in the design and delivery of a new SSC, which is a student module for medical undergraduates called Optimum Health for Later Life. So all of these education offers, research, service delivery are very important for us. 
and we would love to offer ecotherapy. So when I heard about Dr. William Bird, it just felt the perfect thing was to ask him. And I know there are some fabulous organizations, again, a bit like Kitchen on Prescription, who've been delivering all of these approaches. But what we'd like to do as an organization is raise awareness, create connections, and be part of this movement. So I'd love to invite Dr. William Bird up onto the podium. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for inviting me. Um, and it is a real, real pleasure to be here. So as I said, I'm going to kind of do some science. And, uh, but it's also, hopefully, something you can relate to yourselves. But if you're looking after patients, or you're running groups, or you're doing voluntary work, or anything where there's connection to either horticulture, space, places, people, this will hopefully all resonate for you, including your own life. So. I'm not sure if I can... Um... This is a nice picture. Why do we like it? Why do we like it? Why would we feel that if we had a house here, the value of that house would be really high? Whereas if that was a car park, <laughs> the value of that house would be less. Why? Still a house. The view is still there. Why do we feel that this is worth so many more tens of, or hundreds of thousands of pounds that we're willing to pay when actually practically there's no advantage whatsoever because there's no food you can get from that there's no shelter really and the car park can get your car there so what is it in our brains that's making us pay all this extra money why do we go on holiday in places and spend lots of money for a view and for water and for trees there's something tricking our brain there's something which is doing something strange. So let's have a look at what's happened. We were designed to be connected to nature, and we'll go through this in a minute of exactly what is that connection to nature. And yet, 54% of the entire population of the global planet lives in cities. And it's just possible that this disconnection from nature is causing problems. Just a just starting to be thought through now, because cities are where everyone has gone to, and yet we're not perhaps preparing ourselves for what those cities are. So let's find out what we are. What are we? The pinnacle of evolution, really? Do you know only 10% of our cells belong to us? 90% of cells don't belong to our body at all. They belong to creatures, viruses, and bacteria. 90% of every cell in our body is a bacteria or a virus. Only 10% of you are you. Now, it only makes up about 2% of weight, and it's all in the bowel, it's all in the gut. But that's how many viruses and bacteria there are in your body. It's an extraordinary feat, a fact that actually all of that energy going on in that gut is actually you looking after this ecosystem of billions and billions of bacteria and viruses. So that's that's a bit shocking, isn't it? What else have we got here? Energy supplied by an old sea bacterium, the mitochondria. The mitochondria, which we'll really go to in a minute. The mitochondria actually provides all our energy. It also provides the energy for your dog and your cat, and a slug, and a snail, and a tree, and a plant, and moss. In fact, everything that's got a eukaryote life has a bacteria which is called the mitochondria. In other words, it was so successful, we are no different than a bit of moss in how we actually respire. So we're not clever on that either. So most of us isn't us. We're actually from an old little sluggy things. Um, <laughs> our genes make up 1.5% of our genome. In other words, 98.5% 98 of it are mistakes <laughs> of plagues and virus epidemics that came along and viruses then got integrated into our chromosomes and some of them came and created things like the, the placenta came from a particular virus millions of years ago but we kept 1.5 percent of it because that works so this is something of huge wastage and experimentation and that's how we've ended up as us so we've got the viruses there 
And actually, we need to eat soil when we're children in order to prime and calm down our immune system. And things like H. pylori, which any of you who have got medical connections will know actually causes ulcers, only started causing ulcers in our stomach about 150 years ago, actually is a bacteria we desperately need to control our immune system. So what do we do? We give antibiotics to get rid of it and help us deal with our duodenum and ulcers. But those bacteria, the ancient bacteria called the old friends, actually de we depend on them to control our immune system. And when we take too many antibiotics or when we don't have them connected to us, our immune system goes out of control and we start getting autoimmune conditions. And we're going to go into this a lot. So, okay, we're not very special. We're a dog's dinner, basically. <laughs> so let's have a look and see our evolution. Let's think about 100,000 years is probably when our brain's pretty much stabilized where they are now. So going back, let's, it's easy to put 1,000 years to an hour, and then let's go back 100 hours, and 100 hours is four days. So four days ago, um, we were hunter-gatherers. And all the way up to 10 hours ago, we were doing nothing but being brilliant hunter-gatherers. And then 10,000 years ago, which is 10 hours ago, um, we did ag agriculture, still outdoors, still active, still connected to the environment. And then just four hours ago, civilization first started in the Egyptian North Africa. We started getting the first cities. And then nine minutes ago, industrialization. And then changes happened drastically 80 seconds ago. So if you, had an, if you were an IT specialist and you were told to do a programming and for four days you solidly did this program because the customer wanted it really, really kind of quickly on Monday morning. And then 80 seconds before you're about to shake his hand, he said, actually, can you change everything? There's no way that it all could be changed. And that's the problem we've got. We are destined and we are absolutely brilliant hunter-gatherers, and yet incredibly rapidly, we are now living in a completely alien environment, completely different to what we were designed to be. So we're actually no different than we are, were, but the environment has changed. We're still, as we were, we're still people with very, very little connection, but the background has changed. So what happens? Why is that important? Well, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you need people. You worked in groups, and that's so, so important. We know that loneliness is as important as smoking as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Identical in risk factor. So smoking and loneliness are the same. We deal with smoking on the NHS. You, I think, because you're here, and I'm sure the Portland Centre would think loneliness is desperately important to deal with, and that's how integrative medicine works. It's dealing with these issues. The place. We've just looked at that beautiful picture and thought we'd love to be in that garden, but we wouldn't like to be there. And actually, our body goes into complete allergy mode when we see a place like that. It's hostile. It's absolutely what we were not designed to be. And have you got purpose? We hear about the needs. No education, employment, anything like that. What's our purpose? If we don't have purpose as a hunter-gatherer, you're out of the group. That's a disaster. So we want to be with people. We want to be in a lovely place, and we want to have a purpose and feel useful and feel wanted and not neglected. When we get that wrong, then you get fear and chronic stress. And I think the word fear is not used enough. There's fear in many, many things. Not letting your children go out to play, which they used to do when I was younger, that's a fear of a parent. Is it justified fear? Why is this fear that we're not able to do that? So, we're designed to be active, connected, social, and have purpose. We are actually an ecosystem in us. We've got lots of little bacteria and viruses and old bits and pieces and dog's dinner of us all working together, but it actually works pretty well. Um, and when we're not in balance, we get this sort of chronic stress. And this is what we're going to be looking at. What is this chronic stress? What happens when we're out of our comfort zone? So... Does the lack of nature really make a difference, or is it just a nice thing to have? Well, let's look at some... Let's go to here again. Let's look at the middle bit. That's what we don't want it to be. So here's an experiment. 
four pictures given to a whole lot of students and to um, people who are looking at this. And they were put into four groups. One group only looked at the non-tree part. And one group had the bottom one with trees, but it was done subliminally. It was done with a microsecond. It was literally a millisecond into their eyes, and then it disappeared. So they weren't even aware they saw it. So it's that kind of horrible subliminal stuff you kind of fear that we might be seeing on our phones, etc. <laughs> the second, the third group saw the trees, and they were just stable. And the fourth group saw the trees, and someone explained to them what those trees were, what habitats they were, how they they lived, what their what their kind of um, genus was, and just talked about those trees, made the person understand a bit more about the trees. So four groups. Pretty nasty, um, kind of barren seat, uh, uh, escape here of the city. Then the one with the subliminal millisecond. Then the one with the, just the trees, and then the one with it explaining about nature and about the trees there. And then they did this horrible thing, which is called the digit span the backward test. Anyone know what that is? Any researchers here? Oh, it's horrible. You get these figures coming up, and you have to take 13 away all the time. So if you don't like maths, this is your utter and total nightmare. <laughs> So for most people, I think whatever I saw on there, I would be in stress mode completely. I don't care how many trees there were there. It would be completely de devastating. And then they looked at the, how good they were after seeing it, and they, shot pe they kind of reversed people around as well. So this was a, a crossover trial. And those who saw no trees actually did really badly. They'd been looking at these pictures, and when they tried to do the, um, when they tried to do the digit backward spanny thing, it went actually negative. So they were worse off, and they'd done it before. Then the one who'd done subliminally and the ones who just saw it without any kind of commentary, they did the same. They were slightly better. And the one that had that kind of, almost that introduction to the trees did the best. So what it's showing here, in particularly this bit, is that subliminal thing means it was going to our ancient part of our brain. It wasn't conscious that was actually dealing with this. It was actually something much deeper in our, in our brain. Let's have a look at another thing. This is a green space, and there have been so many studies now. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be editing the Oxford textbook of Nature and Public Health. It's be the first time it's come out. Um, and there are 90 authors from around the world. And the amount of research that's coming out of the big universities at Stanford, at Yale, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, um, Melbourne, and a lot of European ones are taking this nature health thing. No longer is it kind of the graveyard of a researcher. It's now where you're going to go up and actually make a name for yourself. And here they looked at the green space in the areas in Wisconsin. And then they said, with lots of adjustment, and of course, rich people tend to live in nice places, so you've always got to adjust for that. They actually found that depression and stress was significantly reduced the more nature there was. And it was adjusted for every aspect you could possibly find. And children, the effect on children is even stronger. The effect on elderly is stronger. The effect of ill people is stronger. Those people who are vulnerable find the connection to nature even better. So let's look at this lot. So this is three groups of children. One who've had a low number of stressful events in their life, so not much bullying, had a pretty good life. The middle lot had middle amount of stressful events, and the high lot have had lots of bullying, perhaps abuse, problems at home, really kind of difficult life they've had. And then this is a measure on the left-hand side of the psychological stress when they did an assessment of all those children. And then they looked and just kind of adjusted of low-nature children who lived uh, without any nature and those who had high nature. And what they found was that the those who had the high number of stressful events in their life, the really difficult problem children, the nature really helped them in reducing their stress. And those who didn't have that buffer, as they call it, actually suffered much more of the stress. So in other words, nature was favoring the disadvantaged children. And then there was a, pop, a study from Mitchell and Popham from Edinburgh um, the MRC unit there, and they looked at the income and saw, does nature favor those who are rich or those who are poor? Well, you can imagine what nature, being blessed, is going to do. So let's look at the rich people. 
On the left is death. Okay, nice, nice sort of kind of jolly thing after our laughter. Um, incidence rate ratio, that's another way of saying death. Okay, it's just a researcher's way of doing it politely. Um, but basically on the bottom here is no green to very green. And you can see here, there's a very slight gradient going down that those who live in a very green area compared to those who live in no green area live slightly longer. The death rate is slightly lower. Okay, and this was millions. This is a millions of um, people in this study. And then middle income, you can see again that those who got very green seem to die prematurely less than those who live in a, a non-green area. And when the poor, you can see it's exactly the same. But what you notice is the gradient is much, much steeper. So what do we want about health inequalities? We want to narrow the gap. So the people who are rich and the people who are poor have the same health. That's what we're aiming for. Look what nature does. The gap between the poor and the rich here in a very green area on death rate is considerably lower than the gap between the rich and the poor where there's no green. In other words, nature's a buffer again on the stress and seems to actually protect those who are poor. So this is starting to add up and there's lots of research coming through. But more recently, they've looked at mothers, expectant mothers, and looked at blood pressure and looked at the health of the child coming out from weight and brain weight as well. And they found that for every 300 meters away from green space, there was an increase of 14% of high blood pressure adjusted for everything else. And birth weight and baby's head size was large within the 500 meters of green space. So stress in the mother, if it's reduced, will actually lead to a better pregnancy and lower blood pressure. Now that starts to have some resonance because, and apologies because that Angelido is the person who did this, this um, who designed this study, and I was about to do, say something a little bit more about Angelido, but um, I didn't. But anyway, this is about stress in pregnancy increases the risk of mental health. So if we can assume that that low blood pressure and the fact the baby is much healthier, and therefore the stress levels of the mother's lower, what happens when mothers are exposed to stress at 21 to 32 weeks? Those children have much higher risk of depression. Now, researchers have used the Dutch famine and the Swedish famine, lots of things where there's been a very short, sharp problem across the whole country and they can measure from the time that that happened where people in different gestations of their birth was. And yet they found in lots of these areas that you can pinpoint where stress is affecting the child forevermore. And depression for children seems to be from the brain development 21 to 32 weeks. Stress from death of a close family member at 32 to 40 weeks increases children with ADHD. And there are other pinpointed areas along the maternal 0 to 40 weeks, which seems to show that actually this is a, the brain developing. Stress in the mother is extremely important for carrying on for the child for the rest of their life in how they're going to deliver. So there seems to be three things that cause the effect of the mental health of a child. Genetic predisposition, obviously some families have got it, some haven't. The prenatal insult, in other words this, and then life stresses further on. But this prenatal, and then it goes on to more, because now, of course, with epigenetics, if that mother has that stressful event at certain points or has a complete disconnection with their child, so the child is stressed because they've been disconnected from a mother in the first few weeks or months of life, then the genes change in the child and that child will have depression and other problems, but they'll pass it on to the next generation and the generation after that. In other words, the genes have changed and it's called epigenetics. And it actually means that they're less able to cope with stress and therefore reduced resilience to stress can be passed on to future generations. So if you think about this whole nature side, if we've got lack of nature and problems, and therefore the entire population at increased risk of stress, we've still got an issue that actually some of this may be passed on. So it's a bit more depressing, but 
And what's happening? We're finding out here that children who actually are born today don't seem to have that connection to nature. Look, look here. This is, this is in Sheffield. And we've got a great-grandfather here of Ed. Ed's up here on the left. He's eight years old. The great-grandfather in 1919 was allowed to roam six miles. Ed's grandfather, when he was eight, in 1950, was able to walk about a mile. But he was still free to go, come back at tea, come back when it's dark, don't worry, we're going to send you out. And he went fishing and he went doing all the stuff with his mates. And then Ed's mum, when she was eight, was only allowed to go half a mile. She had to be back for tea. This is in the 1970s. And then Ed's got 300 metres and he's not allowed out of sight from his mother. And now, that was in, 19, that was in 2003, now it's even worse. It's really closed in indoor life. So if we're talking about how nature can actually de-stress people and children and parents, we're now closing our lives in to becoming totally disconnected from nature. Not only are we living in cities, but even where there's green space, we're keeping children indoors. So chronic stress can be caused by this disconnection from nature. Nature improves the health of the least healthy and most deprived communities, so it's a really kind of good guy. Brain function improves the concentration of nature. Nature improves the health of the unborn baby, and this may have a lifelong effect and be passed on to future generations. So we can start to see the pattern of where our problem is, our deep-rooted problem, because we've now got generations coming through who've now been totally disconnected. So we've got our loneliness, we've got our horrible environment and we've got lack of purpose. We're dealing with the middle one really at the moment. That creates this resilience to stress if we get it right. And if we get it wrong, you don't get that resilience. And that's all due to genetics, epigenetics, maternal stress and all those things. If we get it wrong, if you're stressed, what's the best cure for stress? It's fat and sugar. It's brilliant. It works. So does alcohol. It works. So does smoking. All of them temporarily. So Chronic stress leads to poor health behavior because those are the things that can help us. And we've all been there. We've all know what it's like. We also become inactive. Evolution has actually made us conserve our energy when we're stressed because we don't know what's going to happen next. So we become very, our inertia of trying to go is tired. So chronic stress and poor health behavior are a result of when all of this goes wrong. And this goes on to the science. So this is when the laughter is going to be taken out of you completely now, because I'm going to go right down into the depths of your cells, right to understand. And you'll see what you're doing now as you're sitting there. And then this leads to the things that I do as a GP, which is far too late. We just mop up at the bottom. We're the janitors. We just clean up the mess that's been made all the way up here. And I'm afraid our effect of it is not very great. We should be up here. This is, what you're, this is exactly what we're doing here. You know, Elizabeth, I think this is your vision. Yeah. Up here, not diving in at the bottom when it's all too late, which is unfortunately where most of us have to come. All right, inflammation. What is inflammation? Inflammation is when you get an illness. When you get an illness, you get a temperature. When you cut yourself, it goes red. Your body's immune system dives in, sorts things out, and then comes back out again. Unfortunately, what's happening now is our immune system seems to be on permanent on, constantly fighting against everything in our body. It's really unhappy, and it's not switching off. And that's called chronic inflammation. And it's now thought to be the cause of causes. It's the cause of virtually every long-term condition. Arthritis, cancers, cardiovascular disease, the atheroma, the little bit of clotting you get in the artery. It's all about inflammation of the artery. Diabetes is about the inflammation for which muscles can deal with, but in the pancreas as well. Anxiety is purely inflammation of the brain. They've now realized that you take out inflammation, anxiety disappears. So inflammation is about anxiety and depression, obesity and dementia. And actually that list goes on to about 20 other conditions. And it can be measured now in children who are overweight and inactive as young as six years old. So already the damage is being done in children, but we won't see it until they're about 30, 40 or 50 years old. So we should never look at chronic disease as an adult problem. It's a continuum where damage is starting in tiny children 
and building and building and building. And we just have cut-off points where we might call hypertension or cut-off points called diabetes or cut-off points where a heart attack occurs. But actually, if we look inside ourselves, we'll start to see a horrible, it'd be a horrible thing to do, we'll start to see this chronic inflammation in some of us more than others. So what causes this chronic inflammation? What's gone wrong? Well, when we're stressed, we become inactive. Okay, so we've just went through that. Chronic stress actually causes visceral fat. That's the fat inside you. That's the fat which is really hidden inside you, wrapped around your, butt, your liver, your bowel, and it's toxic. It's dangerous. It's the fat you can't see, but it makes that little bit of a paunch there for us guys. I have to hold it in. That's the waist circumference. It's not the fat on the hips, which is actually completely safe. And when you're stressed, you get more visceral fat. And when you're inactive, you get more visceral fat. So it generates lots of inflammation and it increases mortality by a lot. Here it is. This is white stuff here. Up there is a really good guy of 0.5 litres of it. That's 4.3 litres of it inside us. And this study showed if you walk for 13 weeks, 60 minutes a day, and don't lose any weight, in other words, take a little bit of extra, then when you measure your fat, your visceral fat plummets. It drops considerably. Your subcutaneous fat drops a tiny bit, but your muscle will have gone up a bit, so your weight stays the same. Visceral fat is causing inflammation. It's damaged fat. It's bad fat. It's a tumor. It's nasty. And constantly, the more we have, the more our body is being really attacked by our own immune system. And that's the visceral fat doing a lot of that. If you walk, that's all you have to do, you can reduce it significantly. You can lose weight, which will help, but walking or exercise targets that. What about muscles? What do they got to do in a bit of diet? Well, every time you contract your muscles, you release something called an anti-inflammatory, which takes away the inflammation. They're called myokines. It's like a statin. It's like a bit of aspirin coming around your body. So every time you get up and walk about, you actually are releasing an anti-inflammatory to calm the immune system down and stop it going into overdrive. These myokines are really released out all the time and they cut off the immune system, particularly if you have a meal of high sugar and high fat. When you have a meal of high sugar and high fat, the body's not designed for it. That's the 80 seconds, really, of our evolution. Suddenly we're having is something which our body really doesn't like. It's not designed to have sugar or high fat. So the immune system says, I don't like this stuff. I'm going into overdrive. And you bring up lots of inflammation. The immune, all the energy from a body has to go into the immune system. What happens after a high fat meal? You feel really tired. Your brain has actually had to divert all its energy to the immune system to deal with this high fat diet and obviously the digestion. If you walk before a meal or walk after that meal, you actually switch off the immune system and it all goes to the brain. So walking before or after a meal actually stops the immune system from having all its um, inflammation. And that means the brain stays connected. So the more this inflammation comes from eating rubbish, the more our brain is being deprived of energy, the less it develops. So no wonder we don't want to have children having lots of sugar and fat. It's not just the calories, it's actually the way the immune system doesn't like it and, and therefore diverts brain inflammation away from the brain. And then finally, we come to our little C bacterium. They have a little orange, or orange, green things here. They're the batteries. It's a dynamo. It needs moving. It doesn't like being still. This is Professor Mike Murphy, whose only job in the world is to study these little chaps here. And he's got a team of 120 researchers looking at nothing else but mitochondria. <laughs> and when I asked if I could have a cup of coffee with him, he said, you're the first person ever to ask a cup of coffee to talk about mitochondria. And I said, well, I'm sad, and so are you. So we kind of, <laughs> so we, we had a cup of coffee, and I learned a lot about it. I learned, actually, it's about the weight of a battery in most of us, because it's in 30 of these mitochondria in every single of the billions of cells that we've got. It's about, what was it, about 10% of our, our body weight or something extraordinary. So let's have a look at them. Right, you're sitting nicely. Stay absolutely still. Don't move. 
No laughter. No laughter. <laughs> Your mitochondria are all charged up. And unfortunately, they're holding that energy in, that electricity between the inner and outer membrane, but they can't quite hold it all in. A few electrons are leaking out. There goes one. There goes one. They're leaking out of you now because you're not moving. You're not, you've got all your batteries charged up. And these, these are called free radicals. You know about these. They're nasty things. They're coming out of every free, single mitochondria, the billions of mitochondria. And they're causing damage to the DNA of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is starting to fall away. So you need lots of the cells. So you, you're losing a few now because you've not moved. Some of them gone away. Right, so you've just released vast amounts of damaging free radicals because you haven't moved. Right, you can move around now. Get around. Right, just a little bit of movement. Fidgeting, kids, people who fidget live longer than people who don't fidget. What were we told as children? Don't fidget, yeah, don't fidget. So they obviously wanted to kill us off. So this is, now you've released all that energy and the mitochondrial charge has gone down. No more free radicals because that dam of electricity has just been reduced. So the more we move, which is why they're designed to be dynamos, the more we stop those free radicals, the more we actually have antioxidants and you get more mitochondria and it cleans up the rest of the cell and it, everything is really, really good. Let's follow one of those free radicals. They come to the chromosomes in the nucleus. Okay, that's pretty high engineering stuff and they hit the telomere. The telomere is the end of a chromosome. It's like the end of a shoelace. Okay, it stops it from all unraveling. It's also extremely important because if that cell keeps on dividing, that telomere gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until eventually it runs out of space and that cell can't divide anymore. And that's called aging, okay? Because you now can't divide that cell. So that cell goes and there's nothing to replace it. So our skin gets thinner, our muscles get thinner, our hair gets thinner. It's all sad, isn't it? That's where we get. And that's because these guys here, the telomeres, the longer the telomere, the longer you live. The shorter the telomere, the shorter your lifespan. Insurance companies are able now to measure your telomere, and of course they're going to put your premium to your telomere length. And that is starting to happen. It's quite worrying. So telomeres are really, really important. They're in every single chromosome on the body. But unfortunately, because of their constituent, they're very vulnerable to free radicals coming out of that mitochondria when you're sitting still from attacking it. And if it knocks off a few of those telomere base, bases, then it's basically shortening your life. So cigarettes, 20 cigarettes a day, releases lots of free radicals, and that actually shortens it by 6% per year. So that's why you live long, less longer. So it goes to seven years, seven and a half years by the time you're about 60 or 70. It's all about the telomeres. And that cell now has come to the end of its telomeres because you've been sitting for far too long, you've been eating far too much fat and sugar, and you're stressed because you've not seen any nature. So this is your typical person in Western society. So their telomeres have come to the end, that cell can no longer divide, it goes into senescence, which basically sends out loads of inflammation to say, destroy me because I'm not useful anymore, and the immune system goes and destroys that. But it had to send out lots and lots of inflammation. So, telomeres are also reduced. People who sleep less than five hours, which is me. <laughs> I don't sleep very much, I choose to, but actually 6% shorter. Maternal stress causes it. Carers have much shorter telomeres than non-carers when they've divided it. Children who've been maltreated, from the age of nine, their telomeres are already shorter than a child who hasn't had maltreatment. Social disadvantage, poor education, smoking, alcohol, obesity, they all cause this telomere shortening. Hence, their life expectancy is going to be less. The only thing that can reverse it is physical activity. And it can reverse it to a, quite a big extent. It can actually add on some more of the telomere. But the telomere shortening is now what's the window into people's lives of how well you really are. And if you've had a bad start in life, you start with a shorter telomere. So what have we come? We've done a lot. We've, we've kind of really come to the crux of every single bit of health. 
Chronic stress, obesity links to inflammation by inc increasing visceral fat and creating more free radicals. Contracting muscles, they switch, you, switch off the always-on immune system. The free radicals cause damage to telomeres and then the cell cannot divide. The cell goes into the cells and creates more inflammation. It's all about inflammation. It's all about telomeres. It's all about the mitochondria. There's also another little bit, the brain. We haven't really touched about, about brain. Every time you're active and you walk around, you'll release something called the brain-derived neurotropic factor. People think that's how we became really, really advanced because that stuff is released when you're active and only when you're active, and it actually creates more brain tissue, more synapses, and repairs the brain. So if you're totally inactive, the risk of dementia is increased by 40%, and the risk of depression and anxiety. So the anxiety, um, physical activity is better for your brain than doing Sudoku and other things like that. Physical activity is key to the brain. So that's another little thing there. Children who are active, 20% increase in their hippocampus. What's the hippocampus do? Learning and behavior, which is quite good for school. 20% difference between the active children and the inactive children and in the elderly. Children as young as eight, you can start to see the inflammation starting in their arteries. It's already there. And those who are inactive, that's where you start to see it. Natural killer cells are released when you're active and when you're inactive, they calm down again. Natural killer cells take cancer cells away, viruses and other things. And if you actually got cancer, then becoming active straight away reduces the risk of having a recurrence of that cancer by 24%. So the advice is don't rest someone. If someone has cancer and they're, and they're known to you, you don't say, have a rest, I'll do the shopping, I'll do this for you, I'll do that. You actually want them to become as active as possible. Macmillan Cancer have got some really good information about that. So let's have a look see where we got to. We now know that as hunter-gatherers, we need to have social life, we need to have a nice place to be in, we need to have purpose. If we don't get that, we get stressed because our resilience drops, and we also start to doing crazy things with our health, eating the wrong stuff, not sleeping, smoking, drinking, all the bad things. That causes damage to the mitochondria, telomere shortening, chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is the cause of all causes of every long-term condition that we know. So you've got the determinants of health, the social determinants as they're known, the resilience which is built up. These are the effectors, the mechanisms, and these are the outcomes which we have been focusing on all the time. And we've been blind until a few of people at the Portman Center actually understanding that we need to go up to here. So what can we do? So this is medicine, really. We've just seen about it. Loads of things. Medicine, really, is about walking. The health walks, which I set up now, carried on. Patients lead other patients. It's really simple. It's not very exciting. It's not very technical. But you can imagine the technology going on inside those people's mitochondria, the inflammation, the telomeres, all of that going on. High science is going on just by simply walking. We don't have to have additional medication and operations to do that. The green gym is the other thing. And just on this, this is just about conservation work. People, social, place, they're outdoors. Purpose, they're doing something for good. Everything has to have the people, purpose, place. That's what we're trying to always instill. And just to prove that, we had a lady who had a um, polar heart monitor on, and there were a few of them, but we took her on a green gym session. So she went on a green gym session, and we said to her, right, wear your heart monitor, and then do an aerobic session the next day, or the, or the same day, I can't remember, it was the next day. So she did the aerobic session. And then we looked at the heart monitor trace, and it wasn't just her, it was a few others. And we said, right, what have you done in your aerobic session? She said, oh, it was just brilliant. I've got all my pecs sorted out and my glutes. Look at that. And I've got my stomach. I feel really good and really supple now. And what was she talking about? It was her body. It was all about her body, okay, which is great. And she did 20 minutes cardiovascular training zone. And then nothing after that. I mean, it went down after that. Then we asked her, what she done in the green gym? Oh, she said, I met these fantastic people. And then we went and built this thing for butterflies because they don't actually like those things. And we built this area so we can get more of the waters 
coming down because there's some rare plants over there and it was everything was about external everything was about what was happening and I said well do you realize you did two and a half hours cardio training zone she did 20 minutes for aerobics and that was all about health in her mind two and a half hours she didn't even notice that she was doing cardiovascular training but she had done it but it was hidden it was behind the scenes NHS how much money would they give to that they'd give probably some to the aerobics perhaps certainly something if it was done much more in a clinical setting but actually the big effect is actually the outdoor side we've actually done something with the NHS in Reading called beat the street because this is what I'm working on at the moment funded by the NHS very bravely to fund a game that's all we are doing Beatty Street is where we put smart card receivers on lampposts over an entire city or town and we give out thousands and thousands of smart cards. This is not something your average CCG you'd think would be piloting it. And this is actually children turning up and beating a little disc on one of those smart card receivers. And it's all about fun. And there's no mention of health. There's no mention of the NHS. There's no mention of exercise. There's no mention, it's purely a game. But what we can do is by getting 24,000 people playing, which we did in Reading, or 46,000 people in Hertfordshire, we can actually change an entire culture of a population to walk outdoors, connect to parks, connect to rivers, connect to the outdoor world. And the schools all compete against each other. And then the grandparents come and take part in the schools to say, I want to play as well. So you get grandparents and aunts and uncles and neighbours and everyone until you get an entire population. And one we just finished in Scotland, we got 40% of the population playing it. Think how many telomeres are being shortened. Think how many mitochondria are being changed. But the outcome is health. But to the people, it's purely having fun and a game. It's like the lady with the green gym. And you can get lots of data to prove it and get people going in parks and make it all technical for the funders. But actually, what we're doing is creating a game. But we're getting connected back again out of the indoors. So let's have a look at the story. We were designed to be connected to nature. The last 80 seconds of this imaginary four days has actually been disconnection. And we're not ready for it. We're in a hostile environment. We eat more, the wrong things. We exercise less. We lay down the visceral fat. We create inflammation. We shorten our telomeres. And this is leading to the epidemic of chronic disease. Until we sort out this, we can't just mop it all up. I can't be the janitor all the time cleaning up everything. Connecting people to nature is therefore just good medicine. That's all it is. It's good evidence-based medicine. Not quite in the process that we tend to get used to in the NHS, but the outcome is good medicine. So I'll leave you with something which is, I think, very much on the spirit of where we are, and this will be health. So I'll read it out, because some of you may not see it. On Earth's part, all days start beautifully, patiently it revolves, and with its trees and oceans and lakes, deserts and volcanoes, the two of us and the rest of you and all the animals. Thank you very much. I'm really interested in it. We do all Scottish oh. therapy, as you know. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Heard about me, a lot about you. Old people and people with dementia in care homes. And so we get the purpose, getting outside into nature in their gardens and doing the activities. But what we also find is really important is the social part of it. So getting the community volunteers to come along and just have those conversations with, between residents. And um, that can be just as important sometimes yep. as being outside and doing something purposeful. Sometimes we don't actually get along to do a lot of the gardening when those conversations are just happening really freely. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit about sort of the evidence base behind getting out in nature, bringing people together and, then, and what 
the health benefits of that sort of social side. When people look at the um, what what the benefits of nature are, there are kind of two ways you can look at it. One of them is all this sort of the mental side of it. So looking at nature makes us feel better and reduce reduce our stress. But we also know it actually makes people more sociable. When the green gym, you get people who would never ever talk to each other connecting together, and that's probably what you're showing. And the social side of it was far as important, if not more important, than sometimes the environment. And if you're in a hall with a sport, then people feel something alien because they've got a club, people have got different ability to do things. When you're doing something in nature, everyone's equal. And there seems to be a, a much more relaxed way of people being able to connect with each other. So I think um, when we looked at it, it is the three things. It is that p people, the connection. And as you say, it could be an, the excuse simply to meet up with people. And nobody does bothers with the horticulture or the conservation or even the health walk. And I know people who turn up on the health walks and don't do the walk but it's a social aspect. So the evidence on the fact that green space brings people together, fantastic research done in Chicago where they've done identical tower blocks. Some of them they had green space around them, others the green space died off. So you had a perfect control trial. Those tower blocks where there were still trees and grass, people knew who was on their floor more than the tower blocks where there was just concrete left behind there was less violence and domestic violence, and there was less crime. It was because people were connected together and they felt there was a community. Take away that nature and that community disappeared. So it does bring people together. What do you think was going on in that first uh, bit of research about the, um, the urban environment with the trees and without the trees, and then people where there was some uh, explanation, some education around the trees? I think the, I don't know, is the answer, honest answer. I mean, all we can tell is that people that had the kind of just the, the cityscape with no trees at all, there was obviously a little bit of kind of stress on that, and the nature of the trees actually offloaded that stress. And it doesn't need very much stress for our brains not to work quite so well. So it's a very sensitive test, this um, test. The one where they were talked about meant that people started to engage with that nature. Noticing. They were noticing more, yeah, and I don't know exactly, but and I think I'll probably leave it to you to think about what it is, but there's no doubt when you start to notice things, and it's one of the kind of well-being to health, and you start to learn new things, you actually feel more purposed, and you feel more relaxed. So it's probably, the, it's probably noticing and, and learning that help that person feel le less stressed than they were with the others. Yeah, it could be. It could be. So the only way to test that would be if something interacted with, the with a computer. Negative yeah. And yeah. Yes, and it, there are probably quite a few things out to unpack that. But it's certainly interesting just the visual ones. In the Scottish um, study, um, it looked like there was a higher uh, rate of death than there were in, uh, with little nature compared oh, I know. to nature. You noticed that. Why? <laughs> there's, always, there's always somebody who's going to notice that. I did go back to, the, um, to Richard um, with a Mitchell and asked him about that. And he says it's an anomaly they found everywhere, and it's about the inner city um, being slightly abnormal. So some people in a very inner city where there's lots of cafes and places, actually it was quite a pleasant environment, even though there was no nature. And it may have been the kind of more affluent city centres where it kind of slightly offset it. Um, but that was his only explanation, unless there's someone from Strathclyde University or Glasgow here who can actually say that. What about the daylight and the retina effect? People are out sitting out in cafes and things, they're getting... But it could do, from a vitamin... Retina, is... It could be doing that. We, we did, we did, uh, it must be, let's be balanced here. We did that study in the States and it didn't show up anything. And that was because the greenery in the States is in the suburbs, but in the suburbs everyone has to drive. So nobody's actually walking outside. So it actually is a negative correlation. Whereas in the UK, obviously, we've got less dependence on the car. It's an interesting observation. Sounds like an extreme of this. 
uh, is there any research on kind of like what how that's affecting Japanese people? Because they seem to be terribly sort of well behaved and ordered and stuff. But it's like the pictures you shared with me, I was absolutely speechless about this kind of continuous connotation. All I know, it's quite difficult to disentangle it in these growing cities. I know Tokyo has been developed for a long time. But where you're getting development, you get better health anyway, even if there's less nature. And then eventually, it catches up. And actually, the lack of nature starts to have an effect. But certainly in Europe, where cities have now become developed, the lack of nature in some of the older um, cities where it's, there's been a lot of kind of growth in the 60s shows a very, very different picture of people's health. Their perception of their own health is much lower compared to those where it's been planted up. So one can assume that in Tokyo, the perceptions of people's health will start to be affected. Um, obviously, economy and actual affluence helps a lot. We saw that in the Scottish study. So that will always be override um, even the nature. But it, what we're looking for is a time bomb where all these mega cities coming through, where there's going to be no nature at all, that the actual chronic stress will get hi raised higher and higher. Chronic inflammation will follow. Long-term conditions will follow that. So obesity, visceral fat, diabetes all follow, not just because of the inactivity, but because of the chronic stress that's associated with it. So you're saying like at first it might be okay, but like when it's yeah. like my son and his yeah, once it's generations of people living in this kind of position, then it really unless you create the parks and the green space and just planting trees in, in on the streets as we saw can make a big difference. So it's how much you actually plant up. Chicago planted six million trees because of the results of that study. Um, and the mayor was completely taken by it and it was in his study in his so they've created incredibly one of the greener cities in the United States now, and it's starting to have effects. Yeah. So the question is a really good one. Is if physical activity is the best buy in public health and in general practice and in acute care, it's both a treatment and a cure, sorry, treatment and a prevention, why isn't it being pushed out? Why isn't it being practiced? Why aren't my colleagues, your colleagues, not doing it? And I've gone around London to 70 GP practices teaching them about physical activity and getting the responses. It was part of a contract with the NHS London for the Olympics. And what I got from the doctors, and actually it was quite fair, obviously incredibly busy, we all know that. They were uncertain about how safe it was, because nobody had ever taught them. They were uncertain about what they can actually do, to ask, tell a patient. They, nobody taught them about that. They didn't know how important it was, so they thought it was on the bottom of the list of the five big ones. And uh, it's fourth in the world. Um, globally, it's the fourth leading cause of death, premature death. So the other three are diabetes, hypertension, and smoking. But it's above obesity. Most people put obesity above physical activity. It's actually above. So there was an ignorance. When we did the training, it changed everything. They suddenly realized how easy it was to pr promote it, how important it was, and how safe it was. So I'd say it's education. It's just got into the curriculum for medical students this coming year in about 12 medical, um, medical schools. And we're doing it with Public Health England, doing postgraduate as well. But it's just going to be a matter of going through the next year or two, getting to every single GP. So the Yeah, the trouble about putting it in quaff, it then isolates it a little bit. And I think it would be best if it was just done generally for everyone. But it was in quaff for a bit, for hypertension, for a year. And then they took it out again. Um, but, yeah, you know, it needs to be highlighted because it is such a best buy. It is so important. If it was a drug, it would be mandatory for everyone to take. Um. Can I ask a question? Uh, often, uh, when I went to speak to the CCG, they would say, look, we just don't have any money um, in order to push, you know, illness downstream, as it were. It strikes me that we need investment in this model, but I wondered if you had any advice on that because it seems to me that we're in a a catch-22 at the moment and that we're so busy trying to treat acute disease and chronic disease that we can't put in the money to support 
prevention. Um, yeah. Because, you know, not only exercise, but diet is thought to be anti-inflammatory. You know, when yeah. you start to put it all together, <coughs> you, you really could cut down rates of long-term conditions. I think, I mean, the CCGs can be braver, I think, than public health. And sometimes, so in Liverpool, they put two and a half million pounds into physical activity. And that was simply because it, kind of, it was a kind of road to Damascus enlightenment of them to realize if we carry on as we are, we're going to be bankrupt in five years, they said. And their, their finance director said, you've got to do something. And Liverpool really wanted to get onto physical activity. They want to be the fittest city in the whole of the country. See, Bristol, you better watch it because yeah. they're third from bottom at the moment and they're going to overtake. So the CCG said, right, we'll put two and a half million pounds in. Newham have put a lot of money in. Reading have done this for... And it's beginning, I think, to start to come through. And I think once a few CCGs get some benefit... Yes, once they do it, then but, you can say others are doing it. But the return on investment has to be done really well. Yeah. On Somerset, actually, I met the GP in Somerset. It was amazing to see that it's ticking all the boxes. What we're up to, we got rid of uh, Quack, which is the uh, payment for targeting people's blood pressures and blood glucose levels and cholesterol levels. Got rid of it about 18 months ago or two years ago, if we wanted to. Uh, and what's happened is professionals have gone from being driven to hit targets that they don't believe in, but they have to to get an income to keep the practice running. We went through this kind of initial dive thinking, hang on a minute, what, what does all this mean if we're not chasing these targets? Who's going to come and bash us next? To this change in professionalism to thinking, okay, what really means something to people as humans? What, what really makes humans tick? And now we're coming through this development stage where we're, we're starting, we've created a collaboration of 120,000 patient population called Your Health and Wellbeing which is purely focusing on physical activity and nutrition and the mind, social connectedness. That's brilliant. Fantastic. Um, but that is brilliant. Hallelujah. <laughs> I think what needs to happen, hopefully Somerset's uh, successes will yeah. persuade yeah. NHS England that it's a safe thing to do. Yes. But I think you remove all these targets. Or oh, surrogate markers. Yes. Really, and and, and yeah. the rest will follow, I think, because everyone's got the right intentions. We've just got the wrong... Incentives. Well, it releases you to be back to being what a doctor should be doing. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> in, in catchphrase. My catchphrase is treating people as humans, not bags of biology. <laughs> um, even if you can convince all the GPs about the benefits of physical activity, what are the barriers of taking that to green care and making it green activity? Um, Yes, because I have been accused of being tree hugger and all sorts of things by GPs who kind of switched off, look at me and think, are you real? Um, so there's physical activity is, you know, that's been hard enough and yet that should be so obvious. Going to green care is yet another movement forward. Um, I think it's tougher because you, I think the thing, the barrier is probably not the research or the evidence because I think, you know, one can actually get that out now is, is probably there. I think it's actually what, to, as a GP, if I'm a GP and, and you've come to me and said, I want you to do green care, he said, what do I actually do? And what will be measured? And how will I know it's going to be helpful? And I think we've been a little bit slow on developing that more kind of objective measurements. But I think if we can get that right, I think we'll find a green care will come quite quickly because the evidence on brain and how it affects the brain is now so strong that adds on to things like the diet and the social and the physical activity. It just, it just makes, makes it so much more better and, and more cost effective. But I think we just need to be a little bit more objective and scientific about how we actually sell it to a GP so they know exactly what they're meant to be doing. Um, if we just mention green care, and I, and I think some of the wording as well, I think we have to be a bit careful how we word it. Um, I think ecotherapy I, I'm completely comfortable with, but I know that some of the G GPs think it's a bit kind of wacky. Yeah. And sometimes it, you perhaps have to park some of the things that we want to say um, to go back to their language. I don't know what you feel about the green care, how we get GPs on board. Well, I think that's exactly right. We found with Kitchen on Prescription that um, what GPs say is that we want a, a defined course with outcomes and also with a kind of a kite mark so that we know that that particular team can deliver on, on, on that activity in the way that we're expecting. So I suppose in a way, it's a bit like a pharmaceutical dose, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, people are still trapped in, well, not trapped, but I think it's understandable that they, they, they want to truly understand. So I think, again, that's what we're trying to develop is, is a set um, formula, if you like, that then GPs can just look on an IT platform, where's their nearest kitchen on prescription, and that kite mark, and then they know that they can just prescribe. 
that I've spent 15 years going completely wrong direction in trying to get GPs by demedicalizing it and hoping that they would see this as a demedicalized thing that's common sense and got nowhere and then medicalized it like mad to telomeres and, and all of that. And they suddenly say, hey, this is really great. Why haven't we finished? <laughs> so making it scientific and presenting it as a scientific intervention, I think really helps the kind of, you know, that's what, that's as doctors, we, that's what we like to do. Otherwise it becomes a social issue, which feels it should be someone else's job. It's so true. Just a few more minutes, yeah? That's really fascinating, really fascinating. Yes, water as well, because does water do it? And, and does a dock, you know, a dock can even be peaceful. Um, there's lots of virtual reality research going on. They're making trees blue and seeing, does that have the same effect when you, when you have blue trees rather than green trees? And the answer is kind of, it can do. Having no sound or having sound, sometimes if you're in a virtual reality and you have no sound, people's stress levels go higher because it doesn't feel right, something is not quite right, it's almost more sinister. So lots of that research is going on to actually identify. And I think what's going to end up is actually it's the whole package. It's, it's, the, you know, it's like kind of, as we often do in research, we try and identify which bit of a thing. I always say this, you know, in this, if you have a, um, you know, which muscles of it do you have to push up to create a smile? You know, is it the, this muscle or this muscle? Well, it's, it's the whole lot, you know, it's putting it into a pattern. And nature's almost like that. It's, it's, the, it's the whole holistic thing that we can relate to. Um, but deserts and wilderness have a specific role in people um, because they can both be stressful, but if you're with a group of people and you feel safe, they can be extremely exhilarating. As we know, wilderness therapy in the States has been used for years and works very well. And see, the sea has got more restoration in our brain than almost anything else. It's even better than um, woodland. So water adds a huge amount of value to restoration. Our brain seems to like that. We've got so many, but we probably should stop in about five minutes, yeah. Um, I was just wondering about the, um, the slide you showed about inactivity. And I wondered whether it's always damaging to not be active. Um, whether there's some research that distinguishes between being kind of inert and being quiet and, you know, things like meditation or guided relaxation, which can actually be very therapeutic. So it's like sitting still is not always a bad thing, is it? So how do we kind of tease out and, and the sleep, balance and sleeping and sleeping and yeah. being active or, you know? Well, if you actually noticed, you'll be very pleased to know, but one of those slides then, I'll just go back to it there, um, of the telomeres... If you, those of you noticed it, can meditation slow rate of cellular aging? So meditation strengthens lengthens the telomere, but it's in the context of also being active as well. So again, it's part of the whole thing. So the sedentary message from researchers show that physical activity is one thing, and doing your 150 minutes a week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity is really important. But if you sit for 10 hours, stressful, doing your work, then that sitting will cause independent damage, even if you went for a run that evening. That run will not completely compensate for the 10 hours of sitting. In other words, that 10 hours of sitting will have done damage, which won't be repaired again. But the evening run would be great, but we have to break that 10 hours up. Now, I think that actually it is the way we're sitting in driving and sitting, working, is stressful. And I think we've shown here that meditation can actually reduce it. So I think you're right. There's an element where if you're totally meditation or if you're sleeping, it, that doesn't do any damage at all. It actually does lengthen your telomeres. So there's, I think it's a really good point. And I don't think I know the answer completely. And I don't think we've, I've seen research to back it up yet. So it is... Meditation shouldn't be seen as a kind of still thing causing damage because you're still, it's actually enhancing. It's, it's sedentary with permission. <laughs> <laughs> One at the back there, yeah. Just to echo what you said, meditation is a very different thing to sitting still. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And then maybe the whole aspects of respiration and you know, changes yeah. in you know, neuroanatomy with mindfulness. We see those frontal yeah. areas, increased connections. So there's something going on. But that's a very good in fact, re reference is worth just noting, actually, because it's about mindfulness as well yeah. and how it, how it really has a big effect. I think we will have to finish, but there'll be time for networking. If everybody could fill in a questionnaire, if you could bear it. But it is a way of us finding out what other public engagement lectures you would like. But also, if any of you would like to be a friend of the new Portland Centre for Integrative Medicine, which is a community interest company, then do give us your email and we'll contact you. And you would all be members of this, uh, of this movement for change. And another thing is, tomorrow afternoon, there is a healthcare professional seminar here between 2 and 6, looking at integrated uh, medicine approaches to a healthy heart. Uh, if you are not a healthcare professional but would be really interested to come, it is a paid event. It's £50 for that afternoon, but there are some discounts. So again, you could get in touch with us about that if you're interested. But otherwise, thank you. You've been a fantastic audience. And the, the, I have to say the laughter yoga was making me a bit uneasy and I didn't need to worry about you at all. You were <laughs> fabulous. So can we just, uh, again, thank William Bird for coming.